What's up guys, Larry Chen here. Welcome to another episode of Hoonigan Autofocus. Today, we're at Circuit of the Americas for Super Lap Battle. And then for the first time, we have an audience. Whoa! Whoa! Hey, Leif. <laughs> I, I don't know how this happened, but um, so we're basically the, the guys are done for the day and then I just, I'm picking and choosing cars to feature. Um, but we got Nick here. Hi, Nick. How's it going? Uh, thanks for letting us feature your awesome car. This is um, really something else. It's, it's historic, it's beautiful, and it's so cool that it's here in Texas at Circuit of the Americas. So tell, tell us, how did you get this car? Well, actually, uh, my good friend, friend Will Drees, uh, had the car before I did, and uh, he offered me the opportunity of a lifetime to get the car, and as anybody would, I jumped on it. And uh, here it is. So what is the history of this car? I've seen it before, but I don't know the exact history. This is a real uh, Super Taiku, or no, what, what, what series did it? Right? It's, a, it's an endurance car. Okay. Uh, Spoon Sports built it for endurance racing. Uh, Will has a documented uh, list of things the car did. It did compete in the Thunder Hill, the 25 hour Thunder Hill and then went overseas and completed some endurance races there. Also, it was also featured on Top Gear. They did an endurance race with it. And uh, fifth, was it fifth gear? Sorry, fifth gear. Will knows a lot more than I do. Uh, and it was featured with fifth gear, and they raced it, and they competed. They do, do you win. just want to tell us about it? Or? He knows more history than I do. I know a good bit, but okay. he has an in-depth story about it. Okay, but but the, uh, it is actually built by Spoon. Yes. And it's like a legitimate Spoon race car. Yes. He's so happy. Um, the thing is, he's more of a wheel man, I feel like. He's not so much of a history buff, right? But So anytime I asked him anything historic about this car, he kind of looked your way, Yeah. right? So uh, Will, uh, why do you know so much about this car? Uh, so I saw it in, I think it was 2002 at Button Willow. And you know, I was a kid with not two dimes to rub together. And I was like, it had just come out, 2003, I think. And I was like, oh my God, like a, a spoon sports car in the flesh. I will own a car like this one day or this car. And I followed it for about, I don't know, however long, a few years. And I saw it come up for sale, but I was literally living on a couch with no money. And I was like, one day I'll own it. And then I was in Japan years later and my friend called me and said, guess what's for sale? And I kind of kept tabs on it, but I lost it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm on my way. So I literally flew home, had some people that maybe kind of knew the owner, call the owner found it and i was like i'm coming to buy it i landed at lax i hooked up my trailer and i drove up to san francisco from la and first thing was to verify it was the car it was actually the car and then just spent two days up there kind of negotiating back and forth and ended up driving it home and was just like this is like the craziest dream ever so i had followed this car for a long time and when i got it it was really really bad shape it had been raced it had been kind of hacked up so i was like I'm going to get to this and I can't do it right now, but I'll get to it. And I kind of put it in a garage and then eventually when things kind of came around and I finished some other projects of mine, I was like, I'm going to restore this thing, basically how it raced. So in that time that I had it, but it wasn't touching it, I was just doing research and research and research and figuring out exactly what I wanted to do to the car. Why is it that you, this, for some reason, the Euro R, why did it speak to you more than any of the other Spoon cars? I mean, because they've had yeah. the RSX, yeah. right? So, Four-door race cars are like the coolest thing ever, like literally ever. Um, I have a, another track car, it's an ISF, it's a Lexus. So four-door cars are always for me like the best, coolest thing ever. So this was a Honda, which I love Hondas. Uh, it is a spoon car, which they don't make many that aren't for customers. They don't make many period, but they don't. This was the only one that they made for themselves for internal racing. Um, they made this one specifically for the North American market to break into you know, North America, early the 2000s. And they built it for the 25 hours of Thunder Hill. But after they did that, and they did the Thunder Hill a couple times and won their class, it sort of went all over the world. So it went to Germany, raced 24 hours of Nürburgring, it went to England, uh, it did Brick Car. Uh, it raced the first inaugural 24 hours of um, Silverstone. And on that show, Fifth Gear with like Tiff Nadell, and it won. So it has all of this cool history, and I knew some of it, but as I started reading about it, I was like, oh, it was driven by literally a Formula One driver. It just became cooler and cooler and cooler. So I was like, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna put it, make it a track take car, but the more I learned about it, the more I was like, I kind of have to put it back together 
you know, I gotta do this right. And Spoon Sports, you know, you grew up in the Hondas, you're just into Spoon Sports, so. It just takes someone like yourself to really appreciate oh, the nerd history, out, yeah. nerd out over it, because this is kind of one of those cars. I feel like, for example, the the um, Volvo Estate. This is see, that's, I was drive. literally gonna say that. Like, why would anybody want to modify their Volvo Estate to do that kind of duty? But then you, know, you see it, touring and you're car, like, oh, I get it. You know, door to door, jumping curbs. It, it doesn't make sense until it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and when it makes sense, you're like, oh, that's, yeah, sold. Because it's all too easy, as we've seen this weekend, to have a fast Civic yeah. or a fast Integra or a fast Acura NSX. Hondas that were meant to be fast or were bred to be fast yeah. versus this is honestly a grocery getter. I love it. I, there's something about that. So I have always said I'd rather have, I'd rather be a good driver than have, or a fast driver than have a fast car and sort of like Hondas, you could make them fast, but you sort of have to want it to make it happen. And this, that's kind of why I guess Spoon, like they're like, we're gonna take this thing that's literally meant to go get groceries and make it in a race car and it's gonna do well. But the, the bones of that car are actually really good. It's got really good suspension geometry. It's got a really long wheelbase. It's wide, you can fit huge tires on it if you want to. It's got torsional rigidity. It's all the stuff that you sort of want. It's a lot like a BMW M3. Like when you actually drive both of them sort of back to back, you're like, oh, like this is sort of in that class, which is actually why it was kind of built by Honda was to compete in that segment. And I think they did a good job, but not a lot of people take it to the level that Spoon did. But at the same time, that being said, they didn't really do anything crazy. They put a roll cage in it. They balanced an engine. They made some axles that'll last for 24 hours and they sort of raced it. And, you know, it, it didn't necessarily go the fastest, but it, it finished the race and that's kind of the name of the game in 24 hour races. Right, it's the, you know, it's not a 23 hour, 59 minute yeah. race as unfortunately Toyota has experienced yeah. at Le Mans. But um, it, it really did, you know, pouring over the details of this car, it actually did surprise me how subtle some of the modifications yeah. are and how it, it really is just almost a normal street car with just a couple yeah. things. So I, the, the build ethos apparently was basically just take it and, and make it reliable, which you can see, so I took apart the axles. I, I went over everything, literally every nut and bolt panel was off the car. And taking apart stuff, I'm like, oh, these are OEM axles. They're just polished, like someone seriously took time and polished everything out. And they lasted however many 24 hours of race, you know, that car did for years and years. They're probably original stuff and it's like, oh, you know, it's good stuff that they put in the car. They just kind of tweak it just a little bit to make it, to make it last, you know? Well, that really is the spoon thing. It's not about having the most horsepower. I mean, it is Honda. There are Hondas after all, oh, you know, nothing against Hondas, but it's not about the most horsepower. It's about balance. It's about lasting and it's about handling. Yep. So, so actually I, uh, Ishima san was at Button Willow three years ago and I sort of, you know, I was like, hey, I showed him a picture. And I've been to Japan a couple of times and talked to the guys at Spoon, like, hey, I have this car. Can you tell me anything about it? Because there wasn't a lot of info. And, you know, in broken English, he was like, the, the thing I could understand was, oh, that, that, that car handled really good. Like he was, that was like the first thing out of his mouth was, oh, great handling car. That car was great handling. So, you know, good balance, good package, which you see, you know, when you watch the old option videos, that's the, you know, oh, it's balanced. It's got good brakes. It's not too, tires aren't too big for it. It wants to move around. It's playful. It's fun. Yeah. Can, can I just do a quick walk around with yeah. you around the car? Um, so how much is it different body wise or body panel wise than a regular off the showroom floor Euro R? Uh, a Euro R, I'm not sure too much from a Euro R, but this one specifically is a body white. So it didn't come with any undercoating. It was pulled off of the, the production line. So it never got a VIN. So you can't actually register this car even in Japan. Um, the structure, so the Euro R is different than the TSX. There's a lot of differences between those two, but this one is pretty close to your R. So like the rear calipers are aluminum on the your R. They look exactly the same on the TSX, but TSX they're steel. Um, pretty much other than that, it's, it's almost the same car. I think there might be some stitch welding on the subframe, similar to like a, like a DC, uh, DC2 or a CTR where some stuff has a little extra, but you have to know what you're, you go, oh yeah, it's got the three extra spot welds and that's, oh, that's a type R rear subframe. I think there's some stuff like that. Um, but when I was doing the research to restore the car, it was like, 
I would take the calipers off and be like, oh, these are busted. I'm going to get some fresh ones. And be like, oh, wait, hold on. These are, these are Euro. These are specific aluminum ones. And, you know, you kind of had to like, I had to go and be, okay, I'm not going to just throw parts at it. I got to figure out what I need to restore to put back on it. So uh, as far as body wise, I, I mean, the spoon, it never raced with that hood. That hood's a, a dry carbon spoon hood, which is super, super rare. I look for that thing forever. It raced with the OEM hood, which weighs like 50 pounds. And I think that was because of the class it was running on Thunder Hill. Um, it raced in Europe when it had brick car with um, a spoiler. I actually found this one. I look for this one forever. This is a Mooncraft uh, BTCC spoiler, which is super, super rare and really cool. It never had it on it, but it had one when it raced in Europe. And I was doing this back and forth, like, do I want to make it exactly how it raced when it raced in this era or this era? And I sort of was like, you know what? I'm just going to make it really cool. I found this part. I'm like, that's definitely going on the car. Um, but it had a redhead valve here. It changed to this when it went to the States because they mandated this. You couldn't have pressurized fueling. You can see where the cage used to be. And then at some point when it came to NASA, they had to cut the cage from here and, and drop it here. So you could see. Oh, wow. Yeah. So in Japan, they put it up here, which isn't necessarily the best place for it to be. And when they showed up at Thunder Hill, I think the officials were like, no, you got to change a couple things. So it's cool. like. When I was going through it initially, I was like, oh man, so, someone did this. But then it kind of, as I learned more about it, I was like, oh, it just adds to the story of the car, you know? So. Do you know, uh, just from your knowledge, did Spoon ever build like a cord before this? Uh, no, they built one after with the V6 J35. But from what I found out is this is the only CL7 that they built. So they built this for their internal race program. I think they built a blue one maybe for a customer. It's hard to find info on that, but this one specifically was the only one of this car they built for themselves to race. There's just so many things um, as I look at, like even the door handles. Yeah. Are... Oh yeah, so there's weird stuff for the, like, like these are black on the uh, Euro R, not on the TSX. So when I was like, oh, I should find stuff to fix that. And it was sort of like this mega pain to be like, oh, I gotta find the, the black molding. And it's weird because typically when I build cars, I don't care about anything. I just want to have a car that's reliable and goes fast. So it was like a weird change of thought to get this thing how I wanted it to be, you know? Uh, you've spoken like a true Honda guy, really. Trying to find yeah. these things that are ultra rare. It's like one of one in the world yeah. and you want to put it on your car. Uh, it, I just love talking to Honda guys about that. For example, it's like, hey, there's this first aid kit that came with yeah, this yeah. car and I have to find <laughs> the only one in the world that says Honda on it. But this was like next, next level. So it was like, it was rare to begin with. And then it's like, oh, but you have to buy the spoon version of that. So I had to rebuild the diff and I was like, oh, I could get like an OSG, throw that in there. And I was like, nope, I got to get the spoon plates to rebuild the diff, you know, wait on the shipment from, you know, I think I got that stuff in the UK or wherever, had it brought in. So it was like, it was a long process to do it right, but I think it was worth it. Like. I'd never done that before and this was the first time and I was like, okay, cool, like I've now restored a car. It's not a restoration, like this isn't going to like, you know, pebble, but it was, it's cool for like anyone that's into this type of stuff. I was like, oh, that thing's wrapped. That thing kind of came. Well, this car tells a story. There's so many yeah. different, for example, you mentioned this. Yeah, yeah. This is an interesting piece. What's the story with that? So in the 24 hours of Silverstone, they had to have a, a light for the number plates. So, because it's a night race or partially a night race. So when I got the car, it was missing a lot of stuff like this, but I had pictures of all of it. These, it had three holes and then basically I had pictures from 25 feet away. To, and I spent four months looking for, just, just typing in like door light or, or light whatever. And, and just going through pictures for like three weeks in a row straight. And then I'd take a break, be like, I can't look at any more lights on Google. And then eventually I found these and they're a, a, a Land Rover Defender license plate light. And someone in Europe, when it was gonna race in the 25 hours, they were like, oh, we just throw like a license plate light from. So I found them and bought two of them and like sliding them in, it was like, you know, the key into the lock, it fit the holes. I was like, perfect, that's the light. Legitimately somebody before that race in Silverstone just drilled three Straight, holes yeah. with a drill. We need a light, take it off some car in the car park. It's amazing because you probably would have had just as much luck if you typed in spoon uh euro r door oh trust door me light. you should see my search history for all that stuff it was maddening i was like oh man i think i searched this like four nights ago and it was all blurring together but i eventually found them it paid off i, I slid them in i was like okay cool that's handled what's the next thing and we just go down the list 
It's also amazing to me that this is all paint. No, so the hood is actually wrap. Everything else is paint. And this car's been painted probably six times. Um, the rear bumper is original. At one point, the OEM hood flew up and smashed the windshield and damaged the roof. So you can see there was some, some fixing on the roof. I found pictures throughout the years and, and for a little bit, this stripe was like, had no hatching. It was just like a straight cut. So I'd go through and be like, that's the same car, I think, and realize, oh yeah, like it had just been painted a ton of times. So if I had to get fenders painted or I had a repro stickers, I didn't feel that bad painting the fender again. I had these done. Um, I think the, the president of Polyphony Digital raced this car at Thunder Hill one year, and that was their sponsor. I'd had an Olin sponsor when it was in Europe um, for the, the brick car racing. Uh, th it's got Olin's three ways on it, which I had to send in to get rebuilt. And they were just like, we haven't touched these in forever, you know? So it was a bunch of little stuff like that that just needed to happen. Uh, are these wheels uh, original? No, so these are off, uh, I have an NSX uh, Gen 1 and these are Techno Magneso. So they're magnesium alloy wheels. Um, I had f three sets. So it's eight, 17 by eight, 18 by nine and a half. And I just took two of the fronts and just made a square set and was like, these are super cool. They're super light. I love the way they look. I threw them on this car and when, uh, after Nick bought the car, I said, hey, I've got these wheels. They really look cool on the car. Here's what they look like. And before I could even send the text, he was like, I'll take them. Well, it looks like- It looks like it's supposed to, so these- It's supposed to. So why I did it is they look kind of like uh, ITR wheels a little bit. So, but they're a decent size for this car, especially if you're racing sort of like a spec, you know, eight inch wide. Um, and I think they just look perfect. I, I gave him another set of wheels too, some weds, but I, I honestly like these a little more. Um, I guess my final question is why did you sell it? You put so much time yeah. and effort so, and love into this yeah. thing. But you, you know, the good thing is you're still with it. Yeah, so, well, okay, when I bought the car and I posted a picture of it, my Instagram like exploded. People were like, you got the best car. This couldn't have gone to a better person. You're gonna like nerd out on this thing. And Nick literally sent me an, a DM that same day. If you ever sell that thing, I'll totally buy it. And so I finished the car. It sat for a long time, like I said. It kind of bounced a couple friends' houses. I finished the car myself, and then I drove it three or four times, and I, I think at the time I had my NSX, a new Type R, a CRX. A couple, like, I literally had like three or four cars that I was working on, and I sort of went down the list. I was like, what, ha what is done? What am I done working on? And what can I clear out? What has the most other stuff that goes along with it? And this was sort of one of them. So. I, I just sent Nick, I didn't post it, I didn't ask any, I just said, Nick, if you're interested in this, because he has a white one too, I might be selling this. And I was gonna gauge the response. And I was probably honestly gonna keep it if he wasn't interested. And he literally just was like, I'll take it. I, like no price, anything, he's like, I'll just take it. So um, we figured it out and he said, look, anytime you wanna drive it, you wanna fly out to Texas, you can drive it anytime. It's always in California, the mirror shop. So I, I see it all the time. I go and help Amir work on it. He's got questions on it. I know exactly, I rewired it. So he's like, hey, what did you do here? I could do it. So it sort of stayed in the family and I didn't have to store it. So it's like the best case scenario all around. And I see it, you know, three times a year with these things. So it's a lot of fun. Um, that's incredible. That's a great story. Uh, which, which means I have to actually visit you to shoot some of your other cars. Oh yeah. <laughs> because just from what you've told me, it's kind of got me excited about maybe telling the story about some of the other cars yeah, that you yeah, have for sure. build. Um, you know, the, the whole thing about Nick too, I, I loved his quote. So him and uh, Ryan went out, uh, it's the two touring cars, Japanese touring cars, um, or um, touring cars slash endurance cars from that era, right? The early 2000s, battling it out here at Coda, circuit of the Americas. Uh, it was really cool and it was just awesome to see them so happy yeah. just to kind of recreate their JDM fanboy dream. And that was the other thing when Nick was interested, I knew he would drive it and I didn't want to sell it to just some hype beast that was just gonna, you know, slam it all over the gram and it was gonna sit buried somewhere and every once in a while I'll go to Cars and Coffee. I'm like, Nick is, Nick is about it. He's gonna drive this thing hard. So that's why I built it and he's the perfect guy to do it so i was like man um so nick if you're watching this please don't beat me up for saying this but he was saying that he's cried three times i think in his life or what as in his adult life uh once was was when his uh first child was born second was when his second child was born 
Third was when he raced at Coda with this against Ryan and the two uh, cars. It was really incredible to see and it was, it really was emotional. I mean, all around in the pits, everybody was just so stoked on it for no reason at all, really, you know? And it, it doesn't make, it doesn't matter. For, for, a, for a funny story is when this was parked at my, my friend's house for six, eight months when he could start in his garage, the across the street people said, uh, asked his wife, hey, when did Armand buy a taxi cab? So they thought it was a taxi cab and it sort of like puts everything in perspective. Like to us, I would see this thing parked on the street when I go to visit a mirror, I'm passing by and it's pulled out of his shop. And I'm just like, I know this car, I almost wrecked my car trying to look at it. But to anyone else that's not like, you know, in the scene or like goes and does stuff like this, this is like, everyone immediately knows it. They see the blue and the yellow. When I went and looked at the car the first time, I was like, it, it could have been a hunk of bolts. And I still, I was like, oh my God, the spoon livery. And I just, I would have bought it no matter what. It's, it's cool to see people walking by and they're like, oh, we gotta take some pictures of this. We pitted right next to Nick all weekend and it was cool, people were coming in there, taking pictures. It was, it's rad to see that. Well, it just goes to show, I mean, some of these cars, you know, we got thousand horsepower cars, we got all these turbo, crazy, all wheel drive, this, that, and the other, probably some of the fastest cars in the world, right? In terms of time attack. Uh, but this thing, what does it make? 200 something? I think like 240 on a good day, 260 maybe. 240 on a good day and I legitimately posted more pictures of this thing <laughs> than anything else on my Instagram because um, anytime I walk by, you are completely right, anytime I walk by I needed to take a picture of it just because this is what I grew up on too, you yeah. know? This is what I grew up on and this is what I loved seeing. It's just... When, when I sold it, my girlfriend was like, you're gonna regret, this is gonna be like the split window Corvette when you're like 65, like I'm such an idiot, why did I sell that? But I, I told her, I'm like, I've got a lot of this stuff and it's not going away, but I think of all the cars I've bought and sold and, and owned, this is gonna be the one that I'm sort of like, I'm glad I played a part in it, but I'm bummed that I, I'm gonna look back and be like, man, I wish I still had that thing when I'm like 70 and I'm like cruising around, wanna go to Laguna Seca. You know what car would be cool to take up there? Would be this. So. But yeah, we'll see when we get there, but knowing Nick, he'll probably be like, hey, I'll ship it to you and you can drive it and be fine. Just sharing his toys, why don't you? That's the coolest guy ever. That is the coolest thing ever. Um, thank you so much, Will, for talking to us about the history. I, I just, just because th that's really the, the special part of this because it has such a rich racing history for essentially this four-door grocery getter uh, that, I mean, look how much space is wasted in it. I, that's the best part is when you open a rear door and it's just roll cage. It's like, for whatever reason, that's like the coolest thing in the world to me. Yeah, I'm, it's designed to hold five people. You want to see the coolest thing in the whole car? Yeah. I don't know why this was always what I would get the most pumped on, was how clever this is. <laughs> what? That's how you hold the trunk open. It's this such is, a simple design. This is from? That's from Spoon. Yeah, so I have pictures. I have probably 13 or so pictures from when it was being made at Type 1. So this is before Spoon had their other facility. And one of them has this. And I was like, man, that's just so... Every time for some stupid like that, every time I'd open the trunk, I'm like, that's so red. Legit. Some, some Japanese guy was like... Figure that out. Yeah. I was like, I would have put a shock and been like, how can I do this? Like, this is just the most elegant way. To it's funny because you could see over the years, yeah, it's, it's like really worn, worn this down. Yeah. But um, it's fine because it's just... <laughs> Boom. I love that. Yeah. That is so silly. And th this, again, this is like a quirky Honda guy thing. Totally. That's so good. Yeah. All right, cool. Right on. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, love this thing. It's uh, just a piece of racing history that is preserved. And it's still racing, which I love.
that was awesome. So what what just happened right now? Tell me what just happened. <laughs> well, uh, two classic JDM cars had a battle in the, U in the U.S. the Circuit of the Americas. Yeah. Yeah. But like, but uh, how many years after they went into production, or how many years after they actually raised it? It was. Uh, I was telling Nick, it's, it was decades in the making. I mean, yeah. I, we pulled this car literally out, and it's been sitting for 15 years. And they're the same era car. Here's the 2004. Mine's an 04 built. And just to have the two endurance, two endurance cars together on track is one thing, but to get to go out together side by side and just just show everybody what how special those cars really are was just, I mean, it was so beautiful. It was, it was, beautiful it was simply thing. amazing. I mean, the flood of emotions coming in while we're on track, and and after the the, the track experience, it was no horse bar, it was raw. I trusted him, he trusted me 100%. And you couldn't ask for a better friend and a better driver and two better cars in the whole world. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't believe how evenly they were matched on the straightaway. Yeah. But also, like, you guys are legitimately dive bombing each other. Like, especially going to turn one. I saw you lock up a little bit, and that that's kind of the fun aspect yeah. of it. You guys were actually pushing ten tens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was that's what the cars were made for, and it's. We raced with each other for the last three years, and this is actually the, these cars have brought us together even even yeah. more so. So that's what cars do, you know. And these cars are reviving everything that they used to be, and it's totally applicable to this moment right now. Um, so with that said, also another thing is front wheel drive versus yeah. all wheel drive. Yeah, like it, it just it works for whatever reason. Right. I mean, because I guess same era. Right. Uh, well, uh, you need a crazy driver for front wheel drive too. I mean, <laughs> you have to push it pretty hard. You have to push it pretty hard to be able to keep up with such an amazing machine. And I'm glad he trusted me. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you guys were neck and neck the whole time. That was uh, amazing. That was really cool. And plus, I was just so glad to be able to feature both cars here. Um, you guys just happened to be at the same event. And yeah. It's a great story and hopefully it inspires other people to bring some of these cars out of storage. Yeah. Permanent uh, um, away from the sun storage. Yep. Yeah. Yes, please do. America's please racetrack wants, wants your cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You hear that? I think that's a wrap.